Hi, I'm Tori and I am a doctor of physical therapy who specializes in pelvic dysfunction, which means I treat things that can go wrong around the pelvis and this includes sexual dysfunction. If you haven't, do check out the very first video in this series as it speaks more about what's considered normal and abnormal surrounding female libido and it also outlines my intentions behind creating this series, which in short are to walk you through how I would approach treating low libido as a patient who is also a pelvic health provider. Today's video is the final installation in the series and it focuses on how different aspects of lifestyle can impact libido. I do want to share that before focusing on my lifestyle, I would want to rule out other medical, biological, or psychological causes for my low libido first. I do have videos in this series dedicated to examining medications, your physical body, hormones, and your psychology that might be helpful if you haven't yet ruled out those potential causes. Links to those videos can be found in the description below. With that being said, I do think that when examining lifestyle and its potential impact on libido, it is very important and helpful to remember that these influences likely gradually added up over time until a tipping point was reached that is now presenting as low libido, as opposed to a sudden change in one specific aspect of your lifestyle that very obviously resulted in low libido. Said another way, I feel as though all humans can likely tolerate a certain amount of unhealthy habits without consequences. If you can imagine that your health is a cup, you can fill that cup with quite a bit of liquid until that cup overflows. Similarly, I think that humans can fill their lives with quite a bit of unhealthy habits until they reach that point of overflow and end up with unwanted consequences, like low libido. All of this to say, I think that I would be tempted when examining my own lifestyle to excuse or rationalize certain behaviors because I've been doing them my whole life or to dismiss a behavior that might actually be worthy of my attention because I've been doing that for five years and I've only had the libido for one year or something like that. So I want to encourage you when you're examining your own lifestyle to leave room for the idea of an overflowing cup instead of only considering sudden obvious changes in behavior and using that mindset to dismiss or excuse behaviors that might actually warrant your attention and be contributing to your low libido. All right, with the idea of an overflowing cup in mind, let's talk about different aspects of my lifestyle that I would want to examine if I were struggling with low libido. One aspect of my lifestyle that I would want to observe is my sleep. Specifically, how long am I sleeping and how well am I sleeping? Sleep duration and sleep quality. Here is a 2015 longitudinal study published in the Journal of Sexual Medicine that followed 171 healthy women for two weeks and aimed to study how the duration and quality of their sleep affected their sexual health. This study found that longer sleep duration was related to greater next day sexual desire and that a one hour increase in sleep length corresponded to a 14% increase in odds of engagement engaging in partnered sexual activity. In contrast, sleeping longer predicted poor next day genital arousal. However, results showed that women with longer average sleep duration reported better genital arousal than women with shorter average sleep length. Said another way, sleeping longer on average correlated with both improved libido and increased genital arousal. And sleeping just one hour longer than usual correlated with an increased likelihood of engaging in sexual activity. Knowing that sleep in general could impact my libido is one thing, but knowing that getting just one extra hour of sleep could positively impact my sex drive feels more tangible and like something I could actually implement instead of just vaguely trying to improve.
improve my sleep. If I suspected or was curious about sleep duration and how it was influencing my libido, that's where I would begin, by trying to get at least one extra hour of sleep per night and seeing how my libido responded. Sleep quality can be a little bit trickier because what impacts quality of sleep really depends on the individual. However, recognizing that there is a potential connection between sleep quality and libido can be a really helpful first step in the right direction. And I am hopeful that recognizing that that connection exists can motivate you to further investigate your quality of sleep if you suspect that it could be improved. Another aspect of my lifestyle that I would want to examine is my stress level. Generally speaking, chronic stress is accepted as a major contributor to sexual dysfunction by both science and healthcare providers. However, there are very few studies that truly investigate why. Here's what we think we know. Stress creates high levels of cortisol, which is the hormone responsible for your body's fight or flight response. Cortisol receptors are present in most of our cells which means that cortisol impacts a lot of different bodily systems, including our sexual function. Think about that fight or flight response and its biological origin. If you were being chased by a lion and running for your life, you would likely experience a total lack of sexual desire during the chase and for some time afterward until your system recognized that you were safe and calmed down. In that scenario, a total lack of sexual desire would be welcomed, I think, because you've got bigger fish to fry. However, we aren't running from lions or other predators anymore. In today's society, our lions are work deadlines or financial stressors or family issues or other things like this. And the important difference between now and then is that once you outran the lion and your body recognized that you were safe again, your cortisol levels would go back down and your sexual desire would return to its baseline. Nowadays, that lion can chase you all of the time if you let it. You can still feel the stress and pressure of work or money or relationships even in the safety of your own bed. And that's where chronic stress, chronically high levels of cortisol can become problematic for libido. Physiologically, we can prove that chronically high levels of cortisol are correlated with decreased levels of estrogen and testosterone, which are both important in regulating sexual desire. Psychologically, we can also demonstrate that chronically high levels of cortisol are correlated with difficulty focusing on sexual stimuli. So while we do not have all of the answers, we do have strong evidence to suggest that chronic stress can absolutely negatively impact libido, and therefore stress levels are absolutely worthy of investigation when examining your lifestyle and how your lifestyle might be influencing your sex drive. A third aspect of my lifestyle that I'd want to observe is my physical activity level. How important is maintaining physical activity when it comes to libido. The studies in this space are scarce. However, we do know that regular exercise can improve mood, sleep, depression, anxiety, and musculoskeletal issues in postmenopausal women, which does seem to positively contribute to their libido. And we do have this 2014 cross-sectional study that included 370 women between the ages of 40 and 65. This study aimed specifically to investigate physical activity and its relationship to libido and found that sedentary women were more than two and a half times more likely than active women to have sexual dysfunction. But what does being active in this context mean? This study defined active women as women who engage in physical activities of moderate to strong intensity at a frequency of five times per week for a time greater than or equal to 30 minutes. 
Said another way, women who jog for 30 minutes five times a week, or garden, or rock climb, or bike, or hike, or lift weights, or perform some other moderate physical activity, were more than two and a half times more likely to not have sexual dysfunction than their sedentary counterparts. Just like I said when we were talking about sleep, knowing that exercise in general could positively impact my libido is one thing, but knowing that devoting two and a half hours a week to moderate to strong intensity physical activity could have such a significant impact on my libido feels so much more tangible and realistic to actually implement than just trying to vaguely improve my exercise routine. And building off of physical activity, a fourth aspect of my lifestyle that I would want to consider is my weight. It's more challenging to to find studies that investigate how weight and body fat distribution affect female libido. However, we do know that psychologically, obese women are significantly more likely than obese men to experience weight-related discrimination and other forms of social stigma surrounding weight, which absolutely impacts quality of life and arguably could impact other areas of psychological sexual health, like body image. We also know that sexual arousal is intimately related with heart health or the health of our cardiovascular system. While this connection may seem more obvious in men, because an erection is quite literally the penis filling with blood, the exact same phenomenon is responsible for genital arousal in women. Our clitoral and vaginal erectile tissue also fills with blood when we're sexually excited. So there's room to make a connection between cardiovascular health and sexual health health in women, which means there's room to propose that. Since obesity can negatively impact cardiovascular health, it could also negatively impact sexual health. And before I allowed myself to feel completely overwhelmed by unrealistic weight loss goals, I'd remind myself that we have plenty of evidence to suggest that losing between 10 to 20 pounds can result in profound, measurable, positive changes changes in heart health. Finally, I would want to examine my relationship with substances, cigarettes, marijuana, alcohol, and other drugs. There is plenty of evidence that suggests that chronically using these substances has a negative impact on libido and other aspects of sexual health. However, I would guess that someone who uses those substances in an unhealthy way is already aware of that connection. So instead of presenting evidence, I want to say that substance use can be really tricky and the reasons that someone uses a substance frequently can be lighter and easier, like they almost just sort of fell into a habit, but those reasons can also be really personal and heavy and painful. So if it were me, I would try to get really honest with myself about my substance use. I'd want to ask myself reflection questions, like how frequently am I using? Why am I using? Is my sexual health more important, as important, or less important than my relationship with this substance, and why? Also, depending on the kind of relationship that I had with the substance, I'd want to remind myself that this doesn't have to be an all-or-nothing scenario. For instance, if I smoked half a pack of cigarettes a day, instead of trying to quit cold turkey forever, I could try cutting down to maybe five or six cigarettes in a day and commit to a finite amount of time, like a six to eight week period. And then after that six to eight week period was over, I could reevaluate. Did my libido change? Is it worth it for me to continue with this habit change? Or am I not really seeing any relationship between my substance use and my libido? Or if I felt up to a true cold turkey quit, I could try that cold turkey quit for a finite amount of time, a sort of trial period. Maybe I stopped smoking for six weeks. And then at the end of that six week period, I reevaluate. Has my libido changed? 
changed? Do I want to continue down this track? That sort of thing. Like I said, substance use can be tricky and it can have a lot of different layers to it. Try to be gentle and kind to yourself as you investigate this aspect of your lifestyle, but also don't mistake lying to yourself as kindness. And remember that while it may be tempting to totally dismiss this behavioral change because a cold turkey forever quit feels impossible, that this does not have to be an all or nothing scenario. Objectively observing your own lifestyle related behaviors and being honest with yourself about what you observe can be so challenging. And even with the idea of an overflowing cup in mind, it can still be so tempting to dismiss behavioral changes because our brains tell us that those changes have to be overwhelmingly large and last forever in order to be meaningful. I hope that this video not only sheds light on different aspects of lifestyle that might be worthy of your investigation, but also reminds you that lifestyle changes do not have to be ginormous or last forever. Instead of trying to commit to a forever change, you can commit to a six to eight week trial period and reevaluate afterwards. Instead of drastically changing your lifestyle, you can try to get one extra hour of sleep at night or devote 10 minutes a day to a meditation practice, or two and a half hours a week to moderate exercise, or aim to lose 10 pounds instead of 50, or try smoking five or six cigarettes a day instead of trying to quit a half a pack habit cold turkey. Our brains can be such buttholes for lack of a better word, but you are so much more powerful and capable than you think you are. And I hope that you know that you are worthy and deserving of a healthy libido if you want one. On that note, thank you so much for watching. I did find some interesting information about an endocrine disrupting chemical called phthalate that is found in a lot of plastics used in many household items and even in some food packaging. It's been correlated with female low libido in the literature. And while it's legal in the United States, the European Union has much stricter guidelines surrounding its use, especially in food products. If learning more about phthalate interests you, you can check the description below for more resources and information surrounding it. That being said, if you liked this video and found it helpful, please do give it a a thumbs up. And if you didn't like it, do give it a thumbs down and let me know what I can do to improve in the future. Feel free to comment feedback, content suggestions, requests, questions, really anything down below. I do try really hard to read and respond to all of my comments. Don't forget to check me out on Instagram. And finally, if you want to, please do consider subscribing to the channel for more content, not only about pelvic things like today's video, but also about life things. Thank you again so much for watching. I hope that this series was helpful and I also hope that you have a wonderful rest of your day. I will see you in the next video. Bye.